Over, um, over 500 people have participated so far in the Ladakh of workshops, and it really has become a national movement. In addition to the law librarians, and I, I should say five past presidents of the American Association of Law Libraries have participated in these workshops. Um, there's been a huge outpouring from people that have worked in the area of putting the law online for a long time. Uh, Tom Bruce from the Cornell Legal Information Institute and Professor Martin, um, who's the former dean of Cornell, for example, have been instrumental in this process. Um, our colleagues at Princeton who have um, played a huge role in examining the finances of the law and also technically in, in looking at issues on how to repurpose public domain documents um, have played an instrumental role. Um, industry has been a strong participant in this process. Uh, the CEOs of, of FastCase, uh, Ed Walters is here today. Uh, LexisNexis has had representatives at five of our workshops so far. Uh, Tim Stanley from Justia, who founded the Find Law system that, that West uses, um, has been a strong participant. Um, we've also had a lot of people from government that have played a strong role in these workshops. Um, the Secretary of State of California was at the Berkeley workshop just last week, um, had a fascinating conversation with Tim O'Reilly about, about government as platform. And she said that, that um, if people knew how their government worked, um, they would have a stronger ownership stake in it. And I thought that, that was interesting. But we've also had people like David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, uh, the Deputy Chief Technology Officers of the United States have participated and been, been strong proponents. Uh, Law.gov is about a principle. We're asking a lot of questions about things like privacy and technology and how do you do metadata, but there's a basic principle, and the basic principle is this, that if a governmental entity produces legal materials, they should make those materials available in bulk and authenticated. And the reason for that is any other organization, uh, be they a commercial player such as LexisNexis and West, a national library of the people like the Law Library of Congress, a public interest group such as mine that wishes to audit those materials for privacy violations, all those uses need to be available. And today it is very hard if you're a legal researcher, for example, running a civil rights clearinghouse at the University of Washington like Professor Margot Schlanger does, to be able to access things like our district court filings in bulk and do a systematic evaluation. And there are many applications on our legal corpus that are unavailable today because of the way we distribute those materials. And because there are many questions, such as privacy and technology, and costs. Uh, that is why we have had this national conversation, and our hope is that after 15 of these workshops are completed, um, a report can be issued and some general principles can be drafted, and perhaps those will be suggestions to the policymakers. Um, ultimately, many of these issues, such as privacy, are things that we've ignored or they've been dealt with on the outside. For example, uh, my organization posted 50, uh, 50 years of Court of Appeals decisions. And we were responsible for finding all the social security numbers in there and notifying the clerks of the court. We were responsible for coming up with a policy that says, gee, if your name is on Google and you don't like to see your name for whatever reason, we'll list you in our robots.txt file. And I feel very strongly that it is not my role to be deciding issues of what material should be distributed and not. It's the role of society through our formal mechanisms. It's the role of Congress. It is the role of the Judicial Conference. Um, it's the role of the Administrative Conference of the United States. They should be making those decisions about what is public and what is private, not entities that are out there in the commercial sector or in the nonprofit sector. Um, so I have uh, a question for each of our, our panelists, and um, if we have time, then we'll take questions from the audiences. We have a sharp 11 o'clock cutoff um, because we are borrowing the space here from the United States Congress. Um, so Eugene, um, I have heard the objection often that, that legal materials are, are really quite technical, and while a few things obviously ought to be public, we ought to just pick and choose because ordinary citizens really are just in no position to be interpreting these, these complex materials. Now that's sort of a loaded question, but I, I was wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, yes, I'd be delighted to for about three different perspectives. First of all, what's the worst that can happen? They won't understand it. Um, that, you know, that, that, that's a risk with everything in, in life. Um, uh, but remember, a lot of the people who wrote the Constitution of the United States were not lawyers. 
the, and the, we, our system relies ultimately uh, on the people keeping its government honest. And, you know, one, you know, if you have something that's technical uh, and it's out there, you know, somebody can read it, not, not understand it, ask some people about it, and probably get it explained. And then they may discover it's not only technical, but it's saying something which is really a problem here, and I want to complain about that, but I wouldn't have known if I'd never seen it because it was too technical for me to understand. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, not, a, not a good argument at all. Uh, and I think it's, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about elitism, but I do, uh, I, critically, but I do think it's sort of an elitist argument that is profoundly wrong to say, well, w lawyers have this special knowledge and we understand and other people don't. And, uh, or maybe if you have some special education, you're not technically a lawyer, you might understand. But th that's the wrong way to approach any area, including this one, to say, you have to have technical knowledge to understand this, therefore we won't, won't let you see it. Thank you. Um, Roberta, when I went and first saw you about law.gov, you made a comment that I found very interesting. Um, you run the Global Legal Information Network, which is uh, laws of all the countries, and you told me that this was as much about international trade as it was about Americans being able to access the law. I was wondering if you could comment on the importance of access to our legal materials for people in other countries. Excuse me. And actually, Carl, I wish that it was all the nations of the world. Unfortunately, um, Glynn only includes 50 countries right now. So, of course, our goal would be that it would include um, every jurisdiction, not even just nations, but uh, we have a long way to go on that one. But yes, um, as Justinian realized, uh, it was import it's important, of course, for citizens to um, to keep their government honest by knowing the law, but it's also important that the law creates ways for citizens to interact with citizens all over the world. And it's not just government intervention, but it's kind of setting the, 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 the rules of the game so that things happen in an efficient and effective way. Uh, and so the purpose, the reason that the Library of Congress has put so much, um, so many resources into Glynn is first and foremost to be able to support the research needs of the U.S. Congress. Many times those research needs include needing to have access to the laws of other countries. And many of those countries, unfortunately for all of us, are not at the point where they have sophisticated infrastructures that allow for their governments to um, easily disseminate the information, let alone have a commercial publisher who wants to come in there and add all the value add like a verifiable translation. So as a result, we believe that Glynn provides many, many functions in the, um, in the information space and that includes, of course, the diplomatic needs of the United States, the military needs of the United States, and then the trade needs of the U.S. and any country, of course, that's participating because we do not limit access. It's a policy of the Library of Congress, but it also applies to Glenn, based on citizenship or credentials. I think that's a key um, la a landmark or, or key difference between this democracy and many other governments and many other democracies. You don't have to have credentials to access the Library of Congress. Um, Roger, so the, the Magna Carta um, was an interesting document and it was an issue in which sovereignty was no longer the kings, it was the barons. <laughs> and during the Constitutional Convention, one of the big issues was whether we could give the federal government certain powers because that would take sovereignty away from the states. And what they finally realized was that the sovereignty didn't belong to the states and it didn't belong to the federal government, it belonged to the people. And the people were delegating those powers to the states and the federal government. Um, there's a long-standing public policy, going back to Wheaton v. Peters, that says copyright in the law is not there. There is no copyright because the people own the law. And that principle has been applied to the state statutes and it's been applied to building codes. Yet, as, as you've seen, many states assert copyright, many municipalities 
municipalities assert copyright. Um, what are they thinking when they assert copyright over these documents? What, what is the rationale? Do you understand I, that? I do understand that. I, I wish that I knew. I mean, I wish that there was some way to separate the sort of the federal issues from the state issue because it, it would be nice to say there can be no copyright in state issued um, government documents, but it seems like I've, I've asked several copyright experts on this and they say, well, it sort of is and it sort of isn't and there's no real sort of justification for it, and the, but there's also no real explanation for it. There's no decided like statement that says you cannot have the copyright in these materials because you know copyright is a federal regime and, and, and uh, the state government things are a state regime and how do you sort of get the two together? At Georgetown, we're involved in a prog program that is in a couple of other jurisdictions where what we're trying to do is preserve legal information from other jurisdictions. In particular, what we're trying to do is, it's not the bulk access and the canvassing of the law, but it's, it's finding legal materials from, the, it started with uh, the District of Columbia, and we're partnering with um, the university, or, or with the State Law Library in Virginia and State Law Library in Maryland, and the assumption is, if it's a state government document, we're gonna take it and we're gonna put it into these repositories not really saying we're going to ignore or flaunt this copyright regime, but we're going to say we're going to put it there and you really have to come up to say that this is not going to be copyright protected or that, that, that you're going to assert a copyright uh, objection to it. And I'm almost wishing that, you know, sort of wishing but not wishing that there were a confrontation where we would actually get to the answer of that question of can it be copyrighted and can, and then under what circumstances can these things be protected? I know it came up in Oregon and you had had some some issues there and they've essentially kind of backed down. We've got all of these California examples here that we're trying to grapple with and it really is a, a, a fundamental question of how can we uh, make it so that they're not protected by copyright yet still pr protect and, and preserve this state sovereign um, um, status of things. Okay, well thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have a couple minutes left for uh, if there's any questions or comments. Um, uh, in the back. Uh, so the question is whether there's any prospects for a, a consistent um, markup format for electronic documents, uh, particularly consistent with the formats that are already being used by the House and Senate. Any comments on that? Do you want? Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm under the impression, I'm not active in this, but we do have a law library staff member who participates in an AALL panel that is looking at standard citation format across all documents. And um, I, I think that that's going to be key. That's part of the whole challenge of access. If we, have, uh, if we do not have standard citation, then it's very, very difficult for us to be consistently communicating with us. Um, Representative Lundgren sort of talked about the, I call it the coral reef of the law. And one of the prerequisites of having this hodgepodge of, cre of the creation of the jurisprudence tapestry is that we have consistent addressing no matter what the, 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 the legal information is. So I take my hat off to AALL, uh, who's been really very active in this. I believe the American Bar Association has taken a supporting but subordinate role in this movement. Um, Ed, I think you're involved in that. Am I casting it in the correct light in terms of the broad mandate that, uh, that AALL is looking at? Absolutely. Okay, so, so I would say that. And, and then I'll make one comment on that. And, and that has to be both at the document level, but also at the section level. I mean, section in the sort of literal sense of what section of, of the particular bill or statute you're looking at, but also the paragraph, the sentence, and things like that. So if, for instance, you're citing to something where you know the reporter volume or you, you know the, the case citation of, of a, a, something that's come out, you need to know what page, what, well, not necessarily what page, but what section, what paragraph, pinpoint what it is that you're looking for in order to really know what's being referred to. 
Um, so in addition to the, the um, citation mechanisms, the, the idea of vendor neutral citation and consistent citation mechanisms, uh, we had a two-day workshop at Cornell that looked in great depth at the issues of metadata, of, of markup of state statutes in particular. Um, and one of the things we looked at are, are a variety of markup standards that are out there, including what's being used by, by the House, um, what's being used in Europe, where, where they've had to normalize their laws across many different countries. Um, one of the leaders right now in this area is, is the Government Printing Office, which has been working with the Office of the Federal Register, and they've done really good work on the um, Code of Federal Regulations and the Federal Register and, and working on that. Um, I think the issue here is that this is a long, ongoing process, and it's a function of government that needs to be done on a regular basis. It's the kind of standards um, that really work best in practice. So rather than sitting down once and saying this is the ultimate standard for markup or citation, um, there needs to be an ongoing attention to these issues within the government by the people charged with actually producing these documents. And that's actually one of the key things we're looking at law.gov is not can a super agency be created in the government that replaces West, but, but instead can, can the government um, systematically be examining these issues of authentication and preservation and markup and, and citation and, and do so not just once but continue to do so on a regular basis. Uh, Ed Walters from Fast Case. Well, I'm not sure on some of the other areas, but I do think there will be there will be there will be a cost factor. Obviously, uh, you know the the you can, you can, uh, cost is tight now, uh, money's tight now, and it's, if anything's likely to get tighter. And one of the things I think can be very useful about this project, whatever the specific details end up being, is to set out, if it can succeed, is to set out and make it, make it aspirational up and down the line that we want to make these documents available. If it turns out that the, the cost makes it not possible to do that, if it turns out uh, as fully as one would like, if maybe we can find somewhat less expensive ways to do it. Um, I, I know this is a little bit contrary to something you said, but there, you know, sm small fees for service might be possible. At least the documents are, they may not be equally available to every single person, but at least they're available uh, and in practice can probably be gotten out pretty easily if the, if the, if the cost is very low. But <clears throat> you, you will clearly have pri privacy issues. And in terms of any public laws, there shouldn't be copyright issues. I hope you get that case and you win it from the sound of what I've heard because I don't see how you have a justification in copyright on any publicly passed law. Yeah, but co I, cost, cost will, be, will be an issue. We have frequently posted documents and we have never been sued or even been given a nasty letter. The one exception was a takedown notice from the state of Oregon. Um, we said, well, fine, we'll go to court and they instead uh, held hearings and decided to unanimously waive their copyright. Uh, the financial issues are really a key part of this. Um, for example, um, as many know, I firmly believe that, that the dissemination of our district court documents should be without fee. On the other hand, that is $129 million a year used by the judiciary to fund courtroom technology and the dissemination system. And you can't simply say that's going to disappear. Um, you have to look at that and say, well, gee, if that happens, then some things are going to have to happen. For example, Congress or the executive branch may need to help fund some of these services. Um, perhaps filing fees might go up. We have to examine the, the, the business model, if you will. Uh, State of California, the same thing. I objected strongly that the California California Code of Regulations was only available for fee, and when I talked to a state um, uh, official, the official said, look, it's really not an issue of, of copyright or anything, it's an issue of $800,000 a year that's going to go away if we give away these documents, um, and that's an important issue. Um, do we have any closing comments from our panel, and then I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you. No? Oh, thank, thank you very much, everybody. Very much. I really appreciate it.